seated on the dais with me, Pankaj Patel ji, Rishesh bhai, my good friend Sanjay Baru, members of this esteemed audience present here today. First of all, it's uh, wonderful to be back at FIKI. It's been quite a while. And also to see a lot of old friends and some new friends. Pankaji, in his opening address, amongst other things, characterized me as young. Now, that's a, a, an adjective or a euphemism that all of us preciously hang on to for as long as we can. But in the realm of politics, being young sometimes almost becomes a curse. And somehow the only people who seem to get forward, and excuse me, all gentlemen who are present here today, are those who have either gray hair or no hair. Nevertheless, it's, it's wonderful to be back here. The theme of today's AGM is a very, very apt one. We are 70 years into our era of being a free and resurgent country, walking on the vision that have been set forward by our forefathers. And I think that we are at a cusp a new trajectory, a new cusp, where India has the potential to emerge as a world power. But for that potential to be turned into a reality, that charter of economic growth has to be formulated by all of us together. And I firmly believe that two areas of a country's development economic policy and foreign policy must be based on a system of continuity irrespective of any political affiliation. I also do believe that continuity not only in terms of policy making but in terms of ideas in terms of an iterative process. And the last three years have seen a travesty of multiple economic blunders that have not only dented our capability on an employment basis, but also our economic charter. So I stand before you today with my vision for India going forward based on two fundamental precepts. High growth accompanied by an inclusive nature and an ethos of tolerance. Inclusive because I believe that every single one of our citizens, 120 crore Indian citizens, have an equal stake and an equal right in their development as the country charts its way forward. And an ethos of tolerance, not only in terms of being able to express ourselves, not only in terms of being able to live the lives that we want to, but also in the current environment, the air that we breathe. And also in the policy making in terms of a discussion, debate, and even dissent during that process. And I think this is especially important for economic policy making, which is based on data-driven models, on precepts that have to be suited for each individual country as that particular country charts his or her way forward. And therefore, today I stand before you not as an opposition leader, but as a citizen of our proud country that has an equal stake in charting our way forward over the next 10 to 15 years. Now, if we look back in history, 
The 10 years of the UPA government resulted in tremendous economic growth with an inclusive nature. Based on three fundamental pillars. The first pillar, and necessarily so, was high growth. We delivered a CAGA of 8.8% over a decadal period. Never seen before in the history of India. And that growth rate was based on not only enhanced government and private investment, but a structural shift towards a high savings growth, a high investment growth. And as a result of that, India's GDP moved from the sub-500 billion category to almost 1.55 trillion. Per capita income increased from $375 per citizen to almost $1,070 per citizen. That by itself is no mean achievement. But it also had a balancing nature to it. It had an inclusive nature to it. Rural India is certainly the bulwark of our economy. Though only 14% of GDP rides on it, 65% of employment rides on it. And it is where consumption originates for a lot of you sitting in this room. It is where the demand for consumption and consumer durables originates, which then wheels and oils the wheels of the economy going forward. So a concentration on the rural economy is extremely important, and which is what the UPA achieved in its 10 years. 3.3% agricultural growth rate, 7.7% industrial growth rate, and 9.5% services growth rate. Now, that high growth paradigm was accompanied by an inclusive agenda, a rights-based framework. Whether we talk about the Right to Food Security Act, whether you talk about the Manrega program, the largest employment generation program in the world today, 235 crore man days at last count. The Right to Information Act, which today is a weapon in the hands of the common citizen to be able to assert his or her right. The Right to Education Act, the Forest Rights Act, these were all landmark rights-based legislations that were put in place. And therefore, the high growth pillar buttressed by the inclusive development agenda, and finally, the foreign policy agenda. Now, it's no rocket science that today foreign policy is very deeply intertwined with economic policy. And that's what the UPA government brought to bear when in 2008, despite the bitter opposition of my friends in the BJP, and mind you, I call them my friends, unlike other people, despite bitter opposition from the BJP, our former prime minister staked his government on the one, two, three Indo-US nuclear deal. Because he believed that that would be a paradigm shift for India. It was not about an agreement with one country. It was not about a transaction with GE or Westinghouse. It was a story about India arriving at the global table. It was not about a transaction, but it was about India emerging as a strong, resilient, responsible power. It was not about a transaction. It was about ending the nuclear apartheid of India. It was not about a transaction, but it was about ensuring India's energy security for future generations to come. And that was the strong-willed diplomacy with an economic underpinning of the UPA government. Now, that aside, let me go back to where I started from, which is that economic policy has to be contiguous, continuous, and away from any fractious thoughts and processes. The last three years, unfortunately, have seen a huge 
conceptual overwriting of sorts of the UPA's gains to the economy. For reasons best known to the current government, we in India have reached a negative inflection point in many ways, not only in terms of political discourse, but also in the way government views its citizens. And I think that is the greatest tragedy of them all. I remember when I got into public service many, many years ago, politicians used to be painted by the same brush. Inefficient, corrupt, lethargic, inertia-driven, with great regret, I have to say that now, my ilk, we are not alone. All of you, most of you, a lot of you, are enduring the same fate. Your relationships in your singular units, within your families, your relationships as an industry, as business, with your customers, your relationships between yourselves and your suppliers are not based on a principle of guilt, but on a principle of trust. Trust and tolerance are the pillars around which sanctity is built between the citizen and the state. And today, the concept of you're guilty until you're proven innocent, I believe, is antithetical to the philosophy of the idea of India. And I think that is the grave travesty that's being committed today. And you're seeing that manifestation happen. The first and foremost example of that manifestation is demonetization where 86% of our country's currency was sucked in through a vacuum cleaner. Any good idea is based on ideation. And where was the ideation process in this initiative? No one was consulted. Economists decried it. The former RBI governor decried it. But everything was cast aside and the decision was taken. Following that, the process, goalposts were changed every single day. 50 days what, what, was what we were told. And in those 50 days, the rules changed 125 times. Goals were set out which none of us can argue with. Elimination of black money. Elimination of corruption. Jali note samapt karengi. Curbing terrorism. All very good goals. But when they all fell flat like jumlas from the sky, then out came the card of cashless India. And it actually made all of India cashless. It's like draining 86% of a human being's blood and then asking him to dance. Following that, look at the lack of preparedness. We have a total in November 2016, 16 lakh point of sale machines in our country. That means one per 856 citizens. Hardly enough. 70 crore debit cards in our country and only 2.15 lakh ATMs. That means 20 ATMs per 100,000 people. Contrast that with Macau at 250, China at 76, Canada at 220, US at 350. And our Honorable Prime Minister uses acronyms a lot. ATM stand for? What does the ATM stand for? 
right? Automated teller, any time money, right? And that acronym has been changed. We say that the language has changed. You will come, then you will get it. So the whole execution process is today under question. And what was the resultant? 15.44 lakh crores was sucked out of our system. And you know better than I do, because you all represent industry, the economy, that a country's economy is not about M3 alone. It's not about the money that is in the system. It's about the velocity of money. It's about how many times every single note changes hands in a day. That is our wheels of economy. So 15.44 lakh crores was sucked out of the system. The government had opined that 3 to 4 lakh crores will not come back. But at the end of the exercise, 99.99% of that money today is deposited back in the banks. 15.28 crores, lakh crores. That means that this whole exercise was done just to combat 16,000 crores. And mind you, that 16,000 crore figure does not include, and I stand to be corrected, does not include the currency of Indians in Nepal and Bhutan, which is almost about 4,500 crores. Does not include the cost of printing new currency, which is an additional 8,000 crores. So if you ask any citizen, let alone an economist, they will say it was a ludicrous move. The result of that is the wheels of the economy came to a grinding halt. Supply chains were broken. Industry backed up in terms of orders. 15 lakh people lost their jobs in the first three months of CY17. And economic GDP reached its nadir of 5.7%. And this is not even taking into account the human cost of this whole exercise. And I ask you very fervently, please name me one democratic country in the world today that has instilled a program that has resulted in the death of 125 citizens. Never before has monetary policy been used as a tool as we have seen in this exercise. And Lord Keane said in 1919, 100 years ago, and I quote, that there is no subtler, no surer means of overturning the existing basis of society than to debauch the currency, unquote. And as if this were not enough, the second weapon came out of the government's arsenal, which is GST. We were proponents of the GST. We wanted to bring the GST to bear. Seven years, we were kept back by the current government while they were in opposition. But this is not our model of GST. We had very clearly articulated that the Congress model of GST is an 18% cap with a merit and a demerit rate, not the NDA model of a 28% highest bracket with a six lab structure. This is not one nation, one tax. This is one nation, six taxes. We had very clearly articulated that when you bring a GST network, a GSTN process to book, please make sure it is tried and tested. Test it to the heights of pressures, only then implement it. Our words of advice were not heeded to, and result of which, all of you, whenever anyone uploads forms, the GST network crashes. Input claim credits today are still pending. We had very clearly articulated that when this is a landmark movement in our country, it's a paradigm shift. There's no doubt about it. But when this paradigm shift is taking place, take all stakeholders on board. You all run very successful companies. You cannot do that without taking the buy-in of every single stakeholder. 
It is an iterative process. It is an educative process. And mind you, this doesn't affect all of you sitting in this room alone. It affects the small trader living in the Mufisil towns of Guna, of Shippuri, of small, small villages in our country. But it was a hurriedly put in place legislation, which has resulted in tremendous amount of rift in our country. And what has been its effect? On the one hand, whereas the organized sector has been suffering, 56,000 jobs laid off in IT, look at the blood it has in, inflicted on the MSME sector. 40% of our GDP, 80% of our unorganized employment sector apart from agriculture. Small industries have shut down. MSMEs are under great duress. They've had to take greater working capital, cut back on their orders, lay off people. I've spent almost two weeks in Gujarat right now. What has happened in Surat, our Manchester, our textile capital of the world. We used to produce four crore meters of production of cloth a day in Surat alone. It's backed off to two and a half crores. 60,000 crores has been the loss to the textile sector. 89,000 looms have been sold as scrap. 50,000 people have gone back, re-migrated back to their villages. And that's the same story in Ludhiana with the auto parts sector. A 28% levy on auto parts. 30% scaling back on orders. And you hear the same story whether you talk about Tirupur, whether you talk about our chai bagans in Assam, whether you talk about our power looms in Bhivandi, whether you talk about our Banarasi hand looms, across the board, industry and vyaparis today are restive across our country. And I do believe we go back to the question of tolerance. When we put all these suggestions in front of the government, the government rejected all our suggestions. Many of you lobbies took tax accountants, chartered accountants to government. None of it was heeded to. And now, when the negative effects started rolling in, then you have the response from the government and our honorable prime minister saying that the Congress's concept of 18% is not a GST, it's a grand stupid thought. If only this government had listened to the chief economist, the CEA, Mr. Arvind, Arvind Subramaniam, who had said that an RNR, a revenue neutral rate of 15 to 15 and a half percent with a merit and a demerit rate. Now they're doing a lot of cost corrections, but it smacks of an ill-informed government with a very hurried execution process. And the same is the story in the area of employment. A promise of two crore jobs a year. And the last three years record, four lakhs in 2014, two and a half lakhs in 2015, and one lakh 35,000 jobs in 2016. China employs 50,000 people a day. We employ 450, 1%. 13 million jobs a year. We employ 1.3 lakh people a year. I don't think this government understands the portents of a restive population that will emerge through this crisis. And let's look at our economic indicators. I was speaking with Sanjay Baruji and we were talking about 5.7% economic growth in the last quarter rising to 6.3% and jubilation in the government. In 2008, nine, when you and I spoke many a time, the great worldwide recession, India posted 6.9%. The lows of that decade are not even the highs of the last three years. And please remember, the devil is in the details. Facts and figures cannot lie. Look at what's happened to private consumption. Fallen to 6% from 14%. Government consumption, 6% from 16%. IIP to 1.9%. Farm growth to 1.7%. 
And across the board, farmer indebtedness has grown from 8 lakh crores to 12 lakh crores, a 55% increase over three years. 12,000 farmers are committing suicide across our country. Farmers are sitting in Jantar Mantar just now with the skulls and bones of their compatriots. There's not a single person from government who's going to listen to them. Six farmers were shot dead by my government in Madhya Pradesh. If you're going to have demonetization, if you're going to have GST, if you're going to have evaporating margins for farmers, if you're going to have increased indebtedness, it is the recipe for a perfect storm. And the government has to realize that. Exports and manufacturing is going through the same bloodletting. Exports used to grow at 17% CAGR, $374 billion. Last three years, it's fallen from 370 to 262 to 272. People have to understand, government has to understand that there's something wrong with our model. We have to course correct. Grandstanding alone is not going to solve our problems. We must realize where we made a mistake and course correct. And I was, in fact, really, really surprised when I heard our Honorable Prime Minister at this forum yesterday. He talked about the NPA being the greatest scam committed by the UPA. And if I may position, today I firmly believe this government is the greatest NPL for our country, non-performing liability for our country. It's all blame and no game. The question I'd like to ask them, why has NPAs of government banks grown from 1,72,000 crores to 8,40,000 crores over the last three years? A growth of 351% under their watch. Why has the NPAs of private banks grown from 22,000 crores to 1 lakh crores? A growth of 374% under their watch. And yesterday, our Honorable Prime Minister talked about the Financial Resolution Deposit Insurance Bill. So they first hit the economy with demonetization, every citizen of our country. They then hit industry and the traders with GST. And now they're hitting the depositors with this bill. He mentioned on this podium that every deposit will be safeguarded. Well, I believe you. But then please explain to me, if that were the case, why did you bring in a bail-in clause in the Financial Resolution Deposit Insurance Bill? If indeed the depositors' deposits were to be safeguarded, what was the need of a bail-in clause that has only been brought in by countries like Cyprus and Greece? What was the need to bring that step forward? I think all of you in this body also deserve an answer. He talked about the loot and plunder of the UPA. I position to you that if there has been any loot and plunder, it has been the demonetization exercise, where every single citizen of this country has been put to great inconvenience. It is this bill of financial resolution and deposit insurance where every depositor's money will now be at risk. And we will fight this in Parliament. I certainly believe that there has to be a new vision for India. And that vision has to be predicated on a symbolism of inclusive growth and of tolerance. The world is changing. It is becoming interconnected. Technology is a positive disruptor in hitherto conversant business models. Whether we look at agriculture, whether we look at manufacturing, whether we look at services, we have to move up the value chain. We cannot compete on low wages alone. We must bring in product development value addition to gain our rightful place in the Committee of Nations. And that to me is based on possibly four fundamental precepts. The first is the most basic one. Food security. Today, food consumption is a $370 billion business in India. 
going to grow to a trillion by 2025. We are the world's largest producer of milk at 115 million tons. We are the world's second largest producer of fruit and vegetables at 270 million tons. We are the world's third largest food grain producer at 275 million tons. But the tragedy is that we process only 10% of it and 40% of it gets wasted. That is where we need to concentrate on the farm to fork value chain. Bring farmers up the value chain. Use the Amul cooperative model and bring that in various sectors across the country to empower our farmers, bring them up the value chain and be value accretive for our country. The second suggestion is specialization. Countries are competing amongst each other in the world on Michael Porter's theory of comparative advantage and competitive advantage. We need our states to compete on that basis. We need to decide what is the core competency of our states and allow them, excuse me, not allow them, incentivize them to focus on their core competency. Tamil Nadu for automobiles, Gujarat for diamonds and textiles, Bangalore for IT, and so on and so forth. Third, we need to look at three precepts. Machine to manpower ratio, labor to capital ratio, and indirect employment to direct employment ratio. And look at those industries across these three fields where we can actually exploit India's potential. Be that hospitality, be that tourism, be that medical uh, facilities, be that media, be that manufacturing. Focus on those industries and spur them forward. The tourism and le leisure business has been crying for infrastructure status for so long. What is it going to cost the government? All you get is probably a couple of hundred basis points off on your ability to raise loans. We need to push these industries forward. Tourism today creates one out of 11 jobs globally. It has the highest ratio of indirect to direct employment. One is eight is to one. But today, India receives only 9 million tourists against a city-state like Singapore that receives 16 million. Our Taj Mahal, which is our pride, which has just gone under a cloud recently for reasons best known to the people who want to bring it under a cloud, receives half a million tourists a year compared to the Statue of Liberty, which receives 4 million tourists a year. So there is tremendous potential which we need to take forward. And the fourth pillar, I believe, is really looking at research and development and skilling our youngsters. Any successful country, any successful society has created a knowledge ecosystem between colleges, universities, and industry. Whether you look at the US, whether you look at Canada, whether you look at China, whether you look at Japan, that is what we need to create in India, a knowledge ecosystem between our IITs, our IIMs, our universities, and you. So that that brain power of India can be brought to bear, can be exposed to various scenarios, can be used to exercise their intellectual power. Today, R&D in India is only 0.8%, compared to 35 to 4% in the US and Taiwan. Today, skilling is an exercise that is not connected to all of you. We are a supply-driven government, which just needs to pump out youngsters. We need to understand what is it that industry requires and skill our youngsters accordingly so that they can then find a job with all of you. And so finally, my model is an inclusive growth model based on an ethos of tolerance. The libertarian economic model posits the case of a night watchman, a state that guarantees security, military, courts. But I believe that in India, we do not need a libertarian model of a night watchman approach. We need a facilitator approach in India. And that is the model that we need to bring to bear. And the question that I have for all of you very respectfully 
is that are your voices heard today in government? Are your voices heard in the corridors of power? Are your suggestions taken seriously? Because for me, you are important. Not only the rating agencies, but all of you. Because unless we make doing business easier in India for all of you, we will not be able to attract permanent foreign capital in India. And I think that is the question that needs to be answered. I remember when I was Commerce Minister and we put together a transaction cost reduction initiative. We set up nine verticals, leather, pharmaceuticals, textiles, multiple verticals. And we talked to every industry chapter about every single pain point. And then I personally went to every ministry in the government of India and we removed those bottlenecks for every single vertical. The relationship between government and business is the following. Government needs to act like business, be a facilitator. Business needs to act like government, develop an inclusive and equitable growth agenda for our country. And when that merging takes place, when that understanding takes place of each other's priorities, that's when India will move forward. So I certainly believe, ladies and gentlemen, that in India today, the country that I represent does not believe in a single person or a single party having all the answers for our problems. It has to be a collective. And I certainly hope that what our country requires today is no longer the Ache Din promised by this government, but in, in fact, the Sache Din that all of you richly deserve. Thank you very much.